very well. Well, I'm the last, and I, I very well may be the least. We'll see. I guess that's for you to decide. I, I think um, my talk is a nice follow-up to Dr. Johnstone's talk, although I'm a bit more sanguine about diagnosis, to use the humor metaphor that she invoked at the very end. Um, I'm going to present on the alternative model of personality disorders, which I think is a way to try to have the gentle paradigm shift that I was insinuating just a moment ago, where you can retain some aspect of diagnostic labeling for the purposes of billing and treatment matching. And, uh, and I think someone mentioned in the chat at the end of the last talk, providing patients with something to identify with which to identify while also approaching human personality from a whole person, sort of humanistic, bigger picture, less de potentially de dehumanizing and medicalizing a perspective. So to, if you like the alternative model, that's probably what you would like about it is that it, it sprinkles in a lot of the things that Dr. Johnstone was emphasizing, but overlays them on, on, a, on a diagnostic model. And then it has a third leg, which is evidence, which is always nice if you can get it, sometimes mm -hmm. difficult in our field. Um, so uh, the structure of the talk that I'll be sharing today uh, on the DSM-5 alternative model of personality disorders, to start with what's wrong with the old way of doing it, you just had a nice talk about what's wrong with the old way of diagnosing people in general using medical model categories. Secondly, what does the alternative model do to help? And third, what are we supposed to do now that we figured that out? Um, so this is the model that we were led to believe um, uh, we should use to diagnose personality disorders since 1980 in the DSM um, and has been the formal model in the last four editions of that manual. And of course, this has a correspondence in the ICD. In this model, uh, there's 10 or so categories everybody's meant to either be in one of these categories or to not have a personality that's clinically relevant at all. If you're in one of these categories, you should be essentially the same as everybody else in the same category. And that should give the clinician something specific to know about the etiology of those problems as well as what to do about them. And although we've had this model since 1980, we haven't made a whole lot of progress figuring out specific etiology or specific treatments, largely because, as Dr. Johnstone pointed out, these categories are not valid. It's not a valid way to, sep to, to distinguish personality uh, variants. And so we've known this for a long time, uh, and the clinical community has known this for a long time, the research community has known this for a long time, and the question is, what are we going to do about it? What would the replacement be? And um, and does the American Psychiatric Association and World Health Organization have the gumption to actually implement a more valid alternative? Uh, so this came to a head leading up to 2013 when the DSM-5 committee were organized and were given the mandate to, uh, to sort of spearhead a radical change in the way we think about diagnosis in the direction of a more whole person dimensional way of thinking about how people vary from one another. So rather than putting people into boxes saying, this is the kind of personality you have, or you don't have a personality at all, at least insofar as clinical practice is concerned, how can we devise a system in which everyone can kind of be accounted for and can be unique from one another? Um, the issues with this model uh, have been well documented. The first one is comorbidity. It's not the case that most people with a personality disorder diagnosis only have one. Typically, a person with one will have multiple diagnoses. At the same time, the DSM PD model manages to have the opposite problem that two people in the same box will be rather different from one another, typically. So, with an example like obsessive compulsive personality disorder, there's eight symptoms. One only needs four symptoms for a diagnosis. Two patients could have entirely non-overlapping symptoms and still have the same diagnosis. So when you have the problem that most people have more than one diagnosis, but most people with one diagnosis aren't the same as other people with the same diagnosis, it becomes very difficult to establish a common etiology or to establish a specific treatment plan for people given a diagnostic profile. 
Um, and so it shouldn't be super surprising that there's not validated treatments for most of the categories. The one category that has received a lot of attention with respect to psychotherapy is borderline personality disorder. Several treatments are clearly more effective than weightless control and roughly equivalent to one another in terms of their effectiveness. So mentalization-based, transference-focused, dialectical behavior therapy, schema-focused therapy, um, general psychiatric management, they all seem to work okay. Um, all of them have some room for improvement. Uh, at a broader level, there's just you know, no evidence for that diagnosis comes in categories that, that, that you can cut off normal range from abnormal range personality, that you can cut one personality type from one another, and various approaches to testing this issues with data uh, 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 consistently uh, uh, prefer dimensional as opposed to categorical representations of variance in personality and personality disorder. Another problem that the alternative model tried to solve and, and hasn't in my judgment, and we'll talk about that later, is that the symptoms of the DSM mix dysfunction with traits. So they mix questions about what kind of person is this, is this a shy person? Is this a mistrustful person in general with specific kinds of dysfunction? Does this person hurt themselves? Do they have problematic uh, drinking or do they stay at work too late or whatever? And so these two things I will argue later are really important to be able to distinguish the alternative model took a first attempt at doing that. Although, as I say, I think the field has sort of concluded that it wasn't successful at the first pass, but maybe the next time around, we'll get it better. So in the context of all these issues, a number of different studies with different samples of clinicians, students, and researchers, all suggested that people were ready to move on. No one really loves the DSM. There's a few people that like the categories, but by and large, um, there's pretty broad agreement that dimensional models would be better. So this is the context that the DSM committee came into when they sought to, to replace the categorical model. And they ended up settling on three broad solutions. The first is uh, using continuous rather than binary variables so to try to capture the full range of personality functioning. The second is to organize those continuous variables using quantitative evidence, in particular, the covariance structure in between person data primarily, so factor analysis essentially, to organize how those variables are related to one another, rather than the traditional approach, which is to have committees of people sort of decide these are the different constructs and these are what the symptoms should be. And finally, and perhaps the biggest challenge um, is to try to distinguish what a person's like, what is their personality from what kinds of problems are they having in their lives which would merit a diagnosis. And this of course is the problem with personality disorder is that it's both personality and we all have personality, but it's like the problems associated with personality. And I think there are some, but one of the things that really resonated with me, with me with, from Dr. Johnston's talk is this implication that, she didn't kind of put it this way, but this implication that a person kind of is their problems, that you can't divorce who the person is as a whole person from the difficulties that they're having in life. And those two things are really confounded in our diagnostic model in general, but in, in personality disorders in particular. Um, so continuous variables are nothing new to this crowd. This simply means that rather than drawing an arbitrary line between people who have a personality and people who don't, or people who have a disorder and people who don't, you acknowledge the fact that these thing, that there's variation. Of course, there has to be some level of arbitrariness because we have to decide who's gonna get treatment. In my country, you have to decide uh, who, who the health insurance company is going to pay, for whom the health insurance company will pay for treatment. Uh, in some situations, you have to decide in a limited um, healthcare network who, who's eligible for services, et cetera. But um, much like uh, physicians do this with blood pressure, we realize that blood pressure varies in a continuum, and we sort of make judicious decisions about uh, where to cut that line. So that was the first thing is to sort of explicitly acknowledge that personality variables are continuous. Sometimes the word continuous and dimensional get get used to mean the same thing. This is a dimension in fact, but I like to use the word dimension to mean a slightly higher standard or threshold, uh, which is to say that the dimensions or the different continuous should have a meaningful relationship to one another. So by and large, factor analysis has been used uh, in this field anyway, to answer the question of how various continua go together. There's different models for how to think about this. This um, 
picture tries to put these different models together. Um, if you factor analyze personality data, or if you factor analyze general psychopathology data, or if you factor analyze personality disorder symptoms, and you blur your eyes, you more or less get a structure that looks like this. Um, at the top, there's a kind of a general factor. Uh, the more you get away from normal range personality and into problems, that general range factor seems like a global mental health composite uh, that's been called the P factor by some people. And so that's why it's labeled P in this graph. Um, the first two broad components that, that, that can be used to distinguish that are internalizing and externalizing. And then you can continue distinguishing components as you get further and further down a kind of hierarchy um, to the point where you have four broad traits that, that align pretty closely with the big five model of normal range personality. So negative affect has to do with anger and depression, and anxiety, detachment has to do with social withdrawal and lack of interest in things that most people find fun. Antagonism has to do with being a jerk and being impolite and unkind and callous. Disinhibition has to do with being impulsive and poorly regulated, et cetera. And then the idea is that this hierarchy continues to unfold and you can make narrower and narrower distinctions within these traits, all the way down to specific signs and symptoms that might be um, part of a person's specific uh, presentation. Um, there's a little bit of a controversy in the ICD versus the DSM in, in, in whether or not um, psychotic phenomena ought to be included in this kind of model. In the big five, there's of course a fifth trait. That's why they call it the big five and that trait is openness. There's arguments in the literature that openness and psychoticism or schizophrenic kind of spectrum psychopathology share a kind of common source. Um, I could get into that, but it, I'm not planning to. Um, and the, the DSM sort of makes that argument. And so it has a fifth psychoticism dimension. The ICD doesn't. Instead, it splits disinhib disinhibition into its two poles, impulsivity on the one hand and an anencastia or sort of compulsivity and obsessionality on the other. Um, but again, if you blur your eyes, this is, the, this is a more evidence-based way of thinking about how the various psychopathology and personality and personality disorder continua seem to assort one themselves in nature, at least in terms of between person covariant structure, which arguably, I think I'm convinced anyway, is a better way of thinking about how to organize different phenotypes in a diagnostic manual than committees sort of deciding based on legacy uh, what the different disorders are. So that was the second thing is using evidence to organize the continua. The third thing, as I mentioned, is more complicated. And that has to do with distinguishing the person from the person's problems. To illustrate how I think about this issue, and this is not a sort of universal way of thinking about it. I'm, I'm, um, my colleagues and I are sort of one camp in this, in this point of view. I'm gonna share the results of a study that I did with Aidan Wright published a few years ago. Um, this was from the collaborative longitudinal personality disorder data, which was about 700 or so people followed for 10 years. Most of the people were diagnosed with personality disorders uh, at baseline. Uh, we took the baseline data. So these are continuous scores on the 10 DSM personality disorders. We fit a bifactor model with a general PD. Um, uh, the the right-hand side, the sort of residual side was exploratory. So we let we let the model sort of decide what, the dimen what dimensions were left over after you accounted for what all the PDs have in common. So as you can see, um, to start with the general factor, all these coefficients are large enough to suggest that these different ostensible disorders are sharing a lot of common variants. So all that, whatever they have in common can be represented in this general PD factor. One sort of subtlety just to draw your attention to, however, is this borderline coefficient is quite a bit bigger than the rest of them. And that's a finding actually that we found in a few other data sets as well, suggesting that there's something about borderline that's more general than the rest. Um, and I'll get back to that point in just a moment. Uh, one, once you've taken this general factor out, of course, in a bifactor framework, you just have residuals left over and you can factor analyze those residuals. Five factors tended to explain them fairly well. You didn't need one for borderline because as I said, most of the reliable variants in that construct is sucked up by the general factor. What you have left looks a little bit like a big five kind of uh, framework. So you've got disinhibition, uh, 
compulsivity, which is sort of the opposite of disinhibition, social dominance, which is sort of like extroversion, detachment, which is sort of the opposite, and dependency, which is sort of like high agreeableness. So not, not a perfect match to, um, uh, to, to the big five framework, but again, in this kind of work, one, one needs to blur one's eyes. Um, the, the interesting thing, and the reason I wanted to share this has to do with um, this question of how to distinguish traits from dysfunction. So here we plotted th these uh, scores that were invariant across the 10 years in these data, and we plotted them in terms of their course over time. And um, uh, so the, 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 the greater reduction in this value, of course, the lower that score got over time. And what, we, what you notice is the general factor of PD was reducing quite a bit. And we know from this sample that there, the functioning improved substantially over the course of these 10 years. Most people didn't need a diagnosis um, by the end, um, which really at the time challenged the idea that personality disorders were these like stable, intractable, untreatable constructs. Our evidence and evidence from a few other longitudinal studies suggested that they're not really more stable than other kinds of disorders. Um, but where is that instability coming from? By and large, it's coming from the general factor. It's coming from whatever all the PDs have in common, which might be something like general distress or dysfunction. Once you accounted for that, um, the traits stay pretty stable, suggesting something like a person's personality traits don't really change a lot, even with treatment. What changes is their ability to adapt to their world, to fit those traits into their environment in such a way that doesn't lead to problems, which I think is a handy way of thinking about it from a treatment perspective. That's the way I think about it as a clinician, treating people with personality disorders. I'm not trying to make an introverted person extroverted or a disagreeable person agreeable, trying to help them adapt their personality in such a way that it doesn't create problems for themselves or for other people. So these data, I mean, there's methodological issues which one could quibble about, but if but th this kind of model supports that intuition that there's a difference between traits and dysfunction, whereas where dysfunction is something that sort of binds the traits to the, the maladaptive aspects of the traits together, and that's the part that you, you want to target in treatment because that's the part that changes over time. So here's I think what I just sort of said in, in words. If you can split these two pieces out, again, the sort of person and their personality from the person's problems or what's called dysfunction, the alternative model, dysfunction becomes useful for explaining severity. So how, how many problems does this person have on average, irrespective of what specific kinds of problems they have? In data, it seems to be pretty similar to the borderline construct, which we know is a kind of notoriously heterogeneous construct that includes internalizing, externalizing, some psychotic phenomena. Um, clinically, to, to me, the, the, the value of dysfunction is indicating the optimal level of care. Is this a person who doesn't need services, who would benefit from output patient services, who really needs to be in a day treatment, who needs inpatient treatment, who needs constant monitoring? That is really a, a question that is about the overall level of severity rather than, than a specific diagnosis. So that's really a useful thing to know right off the bat is like how mentally healthy is this person? Um, and that's also the thing that you wanna change. Again, regardless of the diagnosis, you want the person to be able to adapt better over time. And so changing a person's dysfunction score really is the treatment target um, as opposed to changing their personality, which may be more difficult to do. So dysfunction can be distinguished in this model from traits. Traits, as I showed you before, are hierarchically arranged. In contrast to dysfunction, which is useful for uh, sort of ranking people in terms of general mental health, traits are useful for distinguishing one person from another within a particular level of dysfunction. So if you have two people who are severe, one person might manifest that severity by every time they get stressed hiding in a closet and not coming out. The other person might go beat people up. The other person might cut themselves. Traits will help you make predictions about which kinds of problems a person is most likely to have. It, it's more effective than the categories for doing this because it provides evidence-based explanations for heterogeneity and comorbidity. The reason for comorbidity is because many PD categories share common traits. The reason for heterogeneity is because there's more traits than just those that are represented in a particular diagnosis. And so a full profile of the entire person's personality gets us around these issues of heterogeneity and comorbidity. You can describe each person in terms of their unique 
profile of psychological attributes rather than trying to fit them into boxes and running into these problems. One of the big advantages is that by using an evidence-based model, we're linking psychiatric diagnosis with how people study individual differences in personality in the lab. So people from personality psychology use models very similar to this. And therefore all of the evidence we have about stability and course, about genetics and heritability, about person environment interaction correlation, about the correlates and pr predictive validity of personality can sort of be migrated into the diagnostic model in a way that provides a very firm foundation uh, for, for diagnosis. Um, so that's, that's what the, the DSM-5 was trying to do, use continua, arrange them using evidence, and then try to separate dysfunction and traits. So now I'll just go briefly into the specifics of how the model is constructed and how, and how it works. Um, there's two parts. Criterion A is called the level of personality functioning. This is a single dimension of overall psychiatric or personological severity with multiple interpenetrating elements. Um, separate from dysfunction is our maladaptive traits. There's five domains that, that look very similar to the five factor model and 25 facets that allow for more specific articulation of the person's uh, personality. Um, so I'll just talk about them briefly. The uh, LPFS or level of personality functioning scale has roots in psychodynamic models of personality organization. This has been maybe a controversial aspect of the model. People who like psychoanalysis may welcome this. People who don't, don't. Um, in the ICD, it's much more atheoretical. It's really just a single composite of overall severity, whatever that means to the clinician. There's, there's some criteria, of course. Um, uh, but there's a lot more inference in personality functioning and the people who like that approach think that it brings a lot of the stuff that you heard about in the previous talk, much more of a model of how human beings relate to one another in their lived lives uh, and which is connected to experience near phenomena. Um, people who don't say, well, psychodynamic models of personality are not sufficiently evidence-based. We can get into that controversy in just a moment. Um, but essentially there are uh, four interpenetrating elements. One is identity. That is, do I have a clear sense of who I am? Can I distinguish myself from other people? Do I bring the sense of who I am from one situation to the next? The next element is self-direction. Do I have long-term goals that are essentially pro-social? Do I take the steps to work towards my long-term goals? The third is empathy. You know, can I feel what other people feel? Can I maintain a sense of of, of that feeling even when I disagree with people. And finally, intimacy. Can I establish mutually satisfying long-term relationships with other people? Um, they're interpenetrating, and I wanna emphasize this point, they're not meant to be factors. So they're not meant to be the kinds of things that you would do a factor analysis and get four different things. The idea is that this is really one common dimension, but that there are different ways of of having dysfunction and that all four of these aspects, identity, self-direction, empathy, and intimacy are, are going to sort of entangle with one another to produce more or less functioning. So you rate a person on each of these four uh, um, uh, dimensions and then you give a person a score and based on um, previous level, based on the score that predicts diagnosis using previous categorical diagnostic strategies, two was selected as the level uh, that you would need uh, to, to, to have a clinically significant personality dysfunction. Um, yeah, this is a really good question. Um, Nikki Van Eyck asks, so how does this general level of functioning differ from dysfunction that's observed in other disorders? This is a, this is a really important question. Um, it's a theoretical question, as I mentioned, the, the DSM used a very psychodynamic kind of way of thinking about what personality dysfunction is. And in that way of thinking, personality dysfunction is really distinct from other kinds of sort of everyday dysfunction. Empirically, I think that distinction has not really uh, been, been uh, proven or, or uh, we, haven't, we haven't been able to come up with measurement tools that can make the kind of distinction that we would like to be able to make. I'm a, personally a little skeptical that we will be able to do this. And I think uh, what you're sort of implying, Nikki, is maybe the way I would go about it and be a little bit more agnostic. 
that's not the way that it was done here. But the, the idea is that the specific, these specific kind of developmental, dynamic developmental tasks, can I, can I, did I get to the anal stage and do I have a separate identity from my parents? That kind of thing is sort of the, the underpinnings of this model. You could, you could have an alternative agnostic kind of model that's like, well, can you, can you like do stuff that's re related to working successfully? Can you parent successfully if you have children? Can you have relationships independent of like the developmental stuff? Um, I don't know that we're going to be, I'm not sure that we're ready yet to make the distinction that we'd like to be able to make. So I, I read some skepticism in your question and I share it. The LOPF uh, interpenetrating dimensions, Derek Fung asks, how are they derived? There was a paper published by Donna Bender and colleagues in 2011 and, and basically they reviewed a, a, a whole bunch of different um, measures designed to assess personality dysfunction. And they, they sort of did a narrative integration of, of the different elements of those different measures. And that's where they decided on these four interpenetrating elements. They, they're, they're meant to cluster into kind of higher order self and other domains. So the idea is that self in relation to other is the kind of core deficit specific to personality disorder. If, if, if one self can't relate to others in a way that's adaptive, then they're gonna have PD is basically the idea. And that comes from, again, primarily psychoanalytic models of dysfunction. The other aspects, so-called criterion B, are traits. Traits have roots in quantitative models of personality structure, things like the five-factor model or the MMPI. Um, um, however, unlike the five-factor model, they focus on maladaptive variations of normal range traits. So these traits are unidimensional. They're not meant to be normally distributed. They're meant to be, and they only capture one tail of each one of the big five traits. It's true that for all five traits, one tail is probabilistically more related to, to difficulties than the other. Although uh, I've criticized this model and other people have as well, because that's, that doesn't mean that for every single person, I think this, this is an example of, of something that gets back to Dr. Johnstone's talk. Um, just because on average people have problems being say too disagreeable, it doesn't mean that your particular patient might not have problems because they're too agreeable. And so this is, this is maybe some, uh, some room for improvement in this model. Nevertheless, the idea is you've got five uh, maladaptive uh, um, uh, uh, distributions that are connected to normal range big five traits. And then there's 25 facets uh, for each one. So these are the higher order domains. And I'll just show you a slide of a study by Abby Moulet um, depicting the facets in relation to borderline personality. I, I presume that you have a sense of what borderline personality is. Um, and so this just gives you a flavor for what the facets are. Um, you know, the, the high score, these are from three different ways of thinking about borderline. The, the different colored bars aren't important really for what I wanna show you here, but emotional liability, uh, excuse me, emotional lability. So uh, instability and affect is one of the high scores, impulsivity, hostility separation, insecurity, depressivity, and anxiety. So this gives you a sense of some of the facets. And so these facets kind of assort themselves within um, the domains of the, five, the maladaptive five-factor model. So that's criterion B. So again, criterion A is overall level of dysfunction according to this sort of psychodynamically oriented dysfunction model. Criterion B is traits, which is five domains and these 25 specific facets. So the idea is you can use criterion A and B together in order to diagnose a patient. The first step would be to determine the overall level of personality dysfunction using the level of personality functioning scale. If, the per, if that person is above uh, the criterion for diagnosis, then you would describe what that person's like using the traits. There are some legacy diagnoses. They kept six of the 10 categories. The idea I think was to bridge care and to uh, sort of ease the transition um, for people who've identified with their diagnosis or for clinics or health insurance to, uh, or other kinds of reimbursement models that are based on diagnosis to not have a massive disruption in healthcare. The idea was to keep some of these things in there. Um, so you can use the trait configuration to say, well, to summarize this overall profile of traits, I would call this person avoidant, or I would call this person obsessive compulsive or whatever. That's not critical, it's not necessary. You don't have to do that, but some clinicians and some patients and some healthcare systems like that. And so that's an option. Uh, but the, the 
the main point is that there's two steps. How dysfunctional is this person in general and what is their personality like? Um, I'll just briefly talk about some, some, um, some ways to assess those constructs. This is after all an assessment meeting. So presumably that's of interest. There are specific scales that are sort of sanctioned and blessed by the DSM-5 work group. Les Mori developed a level of personality functioning scale. It has item content that corresponds directly to what's listed in the LPFS. There's been some research um, uh, on it suggesting that despite having 80 items, it's largely a single factor. So it more or less accomplishes the task of providing a very robust estimate of overall level of personality functioning, at least as operationalized in the manual. Um, I'll give you, I, I put some items on here uh, to show you what, what the difference they're trying to go for. So I don't have many interactions with other people is a dysfunction. It's not a personality trait per se. It's a, it's a behavior that may or may not be functional. Usually it's not functional to not have many positive interactions with other people. Um, I feel like I act totally on impulse is kind of in between. That's a trait item. Um, but it doesn't have a specific object in the world. And so to that degree, it's less, it's less of a functioning item and more of a personality item. But as you can see, when you think about it in terms of item content, it gets pretty challenging to, to, to write items that are purely about personality as opposed to purely about dysfunction. And I cherry pick these items. So it's easy to go into both of these instruments and find items, say on the trait measure that really looks like a functioning item and on the functioning measure that really looks like a trait item. Now there's a, another question, which is of course, even if you were able to do that, are they really different empirically? And I think that's a pretty big challenge. So I'm gonna to get to that challenge in a minute. This, the trait measure that's a, sort of the official measure for the alternative model is the personality inventory for DSM-5. This measure was actually used to derive the trait structure that ended up in the manual. So this instrument was developed before the DSM was published and it was through analyses of the items of this instrument that they decided on the 25 facets that ended up being included in the manual. One interesting thing about this uh, model is that the content of this uh, instrument is all based on the original DSM-5, excuse me, DSM category uh, disorders. So in other words, all the item content in this instrument is the same as all the item content that was in the categorical model, it's just arranged in an evidence-based fashion rather than a committee-based fashion. And Michael First and colleagues developed an interview, excuse me, the SCID-5 alternative model of personality disorders that's also sort of the official instrument. However, many of us as psychological assessors have our own preferred instruments. And so there's a lot of different ways of doing it, doing a, a, an alternative model assessment that don't require to use these specific measures. A number of alternative model measures have de been developed since the introduction of the AMPD. So there's several to measure severity. There's a few to measure traits. They've been developed in different languages. They're different lengths, et cetera. Um, um, I don't think I'm gonna go into a lot of detail, but I'd be happy to, to talk about specific instruments if you like. And you, you, know, you could also just use measures that you are already familiar with and like. So I was trained on the personality assessment inventory. I can get all the information I need about the, the AMPD using that particular instrument. There's measures that are specifically developed to, to assess global levels of functioning. There's a number of other measures uh, developed to assess psychological traits. So the idea is not that you have to use the, the item content or measures developed specifically for this model, but rather it's a kind of heuristic or a general way of thinking about how to divide up personality constructs. And there's evidence for most of the, well, for all of the measures on the right, certainly there's evidence about how the specific scales in those instruments are related to the scales of the sort of official instruments, meaning that you can use the instruments that you like and still derive an alternative model uh, diagnosis. I mentioned uh, the ICD. Uh, this model is very similar, albeit simpler than the alternative model. I've only got one slide about this. Um, it has a single severity component, which just basically says this person has a lot of impairments in their life and there's specific kinds of impairments that are listed there. And there are five maladaptive traits. Uh, it's more or less the same as the alternative model. Again, the only difference is that rather than a psychoticism trait, there's this anencastia trait, um, which is sort of the opposite of disinhibition. It's the more compulsive, obsession, obsessive kind of behaviors, as opposed to the more impulsive, dysregulated kind of behaviors. So there's pretty close convergence. The difference is that in ICD-11, this is the only model. It's not an alternative, whereas in the DSM, the alternative model is still 
sort of sitting side by side uh, with the with the dinosaurs. Okay. Um, looks like I've got about eight minutes to talk about some of the ongoing issues. Um, one of them has to do with, well, what's, I think it's sort of similar to Nikki's question from before. Yeah, but at the end of the day, what's the difference between personality disorder and other kinds of psychopathology? Another question is, what's the difference between personality and personality disorder? Or what's the difference between the person and the problems, this thing that I sort of emphasized earlier? Um, the last two, I think, are the parts for me that connect most to the previous talk, which is how can we get past these kinds of static portraits of what a person's like in general so that we can label them and send that label to our insurance company to get reimbursed towards a model of how does this person live in their life and how does that produce problems within their own particular context? So how can we move from this kind of a model to one that incorporates dynamics and how can we diagnose how can we connect a diagnosis to treatment? Um, so uh, the previous talk mentioned the high top model. This is a model of the covariant structure of psychopathology in general. This model assumes that there's not a, a meaningful difference between personality disorder and other kinds of disorder. And indeed personality disorders, as you can see here and here, fit comfortably within this kind of model. In fact, they're overrepresented relative to a lot of other um, constructs in this model. So from a purely, like if you just take cross-sectional data and do covariance analyses of the different symptoms, you really can't distinguish personality disorder symptoms from other kinds. They tend to be more severe with a few exceptions, uh, but just in terms of covariance, it's sort of individual differences are individual differences and you can't really cleanly separate personality disorder. So what is the basis for thinking that there's such a thing as personality disorder in the first place? I, I have to sort of cop to the fact that I'm of two minds about this. I think there isn't really a basis for doing so empirically. Um, and maybe the high top has it right in a certain sense that we shouldn't be barking up that tree until we have evidence. As a clinician, however, I think it's really meaningful that if I get referred a patient and I'm told the person has a PD, I don't really believe they have a PD, but I believe that they have interpersonal challenges that's going to make treatment engagement difficult. So I have a, a host of associations to that term, which are like this person has a, a lot of dysregulation within attachment contexts, and that's likely to generalize to psychotherapy. So I should put some pieces in place and not assume that they're gonna engage and have a good alliance and that treatment's going to be straightforward. So, um, so I guess that's why I say I'm of two minds about it, that empirically, I couldn't really defend the distinction between personality disorder and other kinds of psychopathology, but clinically, I think knowing that a person has difficulties in close relationships is really important to me. And that's the most important aspect of what that label personality disorder means. And I do think that's what the level of personality functioning scale is trying to get at. Um, whether it can do that is like a different question. Totally. Yeah, Nikki, I, right on the same page. So Nikki asked, do you think, so, I hope it's okay, I use your first name. Do you think it might be worth it in the future to move towards more transdiagnostic framework and as, as, assess dysfunction um, sort of separately uh, without labeling the other psychopathology person? I think that's the right way to do it. To have one model of like, what are the person's actual specific problems in their own life and their own unique culture environment context? And secondly, what kind of person are they? And then Third, what kind of environmental context are they living in? Those are three separate questions. Um, I do still think though that one of the important sub questions in there is, do they have specific difficulties with regulation in attachment context? Because that has such important implications for psychotherapy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think that's right. In fact, we wrote a paper nearly titled uh, what Lucy is saying. Uh, why not just say this person has interpersonal difficulties and, and drop the PD? That's exactly what I would do. Call it the interpersonal section rather than the personality disorder section. And I think everybody wins. Yep. Um, a, a specific problem with the, with the alternative model, as I mentioned before, is that if you look at the items, I cherry picked those two items, but if you look at the items, there's a lot of dysfunction in the traits and there's a lot of traits in the dysfunction. And so when you do studies with both criterion A and criterion B in them, they're really highly correlated. There's no incremental validity. There's no discriminant validity. It's largely getting at a very similar thing. I think part of that is because our methods 
cross-sectional regression modeling is probably not the right way to think about the distinction between the person and the person's problems. But part of it is also just simply content. So a simple solution, that, there's two versions of a very simple solution to this problem. One solution that one camp of people sort of prefers the sort of trait people, the big five sort of camp prefers just get rid of criterion A. We don't need it. It's not doing anything that the traits can't already do. Just use maladaptive traits and you're done. A second possibility, which is my preferred strategy, is get the dysfunction out of traits so that you can more clearly distinguish what the person's like in the abstract in general in their everyday life from what kinds of problems they're experiencing. So we've had a number of papers going back and forth, sort of arguing about which solution would be better. Uh, one of those papers I already presented showing that dysfunction seems to be less stable than traits. And that's, a, that's one reason why clinicians might want to distinguish the two one from the other. I think it's also, for me, I feel strongly about it because for me, honestly, it's an ethical issue. I think to tell somebody that their problems are their personality makes me really uncomfortable. I'd rather say you have a personality, you also have problems. Those things are different from one another. And the diagnosis and treatment is about trying to help you not have problems in the context of a personality, which is just fine. So to me, that's why I feel so strongly about it. But again, that's not an evidence-based reason. We have a current uh, a special issue of Journal of Personality coming out with uh, papers from representatives of HITOP, RDOC, psychodynamic perspectives, CBT, developmental and economic perspectives on this issue. And what I can tell you is they all have different solutions and none of them are satisfactory. So I think this is a really big problem for our field. How can you separate what the person's like from what kinds of problems the person has in their life? This is a really big challenge. Um, I, don't, I don't think I go quite as far as what I sort of read Dr. Johnston is saying. It's like, we'll just get rid of the diagnostic bit. I do sort of wonder if there's a way to integrate this problem with diagnosis, but I do think um, we haven't done a good job of it so far. Um, I only have a couple minutes, so I'm not gonna talk about this in detail. I think the next step really is moving past single snapshots and thinking about dynamics. Uh, we've sort of separated dynamics into three kinds. One is across levels. So within any given moment, there's, for example, what's more conscious and what's less conscious. What's what I would report, what another person would say about me. So there's variations that can be leveraged using multi-method assessment to get different levels of personality. Timothy Leary wrote a great book about this in the 50s that I think still holds up today. Another is variation across um, uh, situations. So ex experience sampling or ambulatory assessment models have really exploded in the last couple of decades. They're designed to get this kind of uh, a variance. So how is a person different at work or at home or in this relationship versus that relationship? And finally, within situations, this is something my lab has been trying to do uh, sort of mod marginally successfully. Um, what's happening as a therapy session unfolds or what's happening as an argument with your spouse unfolds or as an interaction with a child unfolds? What are the dynamics and what are the patterns in those dynamics that indicate better or worse functioning? And really a clinician is going to get information about all three of those things, but so far our diagnoses don't tell us anything about any one of these three things really. Um, and finally, um, I, I, I'm, I think I'm trespassing on my own time here, but I'll just say that the last step, and I think this is really where the convergence with the previous talk comes in is, in some way we're going to have to figure out a way to connect diagnosis to treatment. I think like most of you, if you're doing psychotherapy, the diagnosis tells me very little about how my actual psychotherapy is going to be. Either I have a psychotherapeutic model that I apply to everybody regardless of their diagnosis, or um, it's really the formulation, as Dr. Johnstone was emphasizing, that tells me like what the specific changes from one patient to one patient would be. This sort of glue between diagnosis and treatment is really lacking. That was the hope of the DSM, that by articulating categories of people, we could work out a specific etiology. And if we could do that, then we could work out a specific and discriminate treatment. That project has totally failed. I agree with the previous speaker about that. Um, although I do think that a more evidence-based model of diagnosis that incorporates the whole person and their context may grease the skids towards uh, uh, some informative treatment recommendations. And we've written a little bit about that, but I don't have time to tell you about it. So I think I'll stop now and see if anybody wants to uh, issue a comment or a question, critique, complaint. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Chris.